The lesson they learned from all of this is that war works. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Beyond the Headlines. My name is Jack Siegel, your host this evening, and we have a very special presentation to go through the history and the significance of an event that will reach its 100th anniversary in the next couple of years, and that is the outbreak of World War I. We have with us, uh, we're very, really privileged to have with us an expert on the subject, Brian McCall. He is an instructor in history and political science at Interlochen Arts Academy, has served in that capacity since 1998. He's also an adjunct instructor at Northwestern Michigan College. He did postgraduate study at Central Michigan University. He has a master's degree from Strathclyde University in Scotland another master's in American history from Central Michigan, and a BS in secondary education from Central Michigan. Brian McCall, welcome to Beyond the Headlines. Thank you, Jack. Great to have pleasure, you here. Pleasure to be here. The, uh, the subject of World War I is, uh, is such a huge one that uh, you, could, uh, you could write many, many books or read many, many books about it, and uh, yet it is, uh, I would say, a central part of anyone's study of diplomatic history and the history of warfare. Uh, what gives it this great significance in your mind? I think that in, um, there's a lot of references of the end of an era, the beginning of an era, um, and the enormous tragedy that this event was. There's no other way to describe it other than tragic. It's the most, um, most people who study this carefully would say is, it was inevitable, but at the same time, totally preventable. There, there's the reasons for going to war a year to two years into it for many, especially for the soldiers, seemed so pointless. It, it was um, something to endure as opposed to something to to partake in and take. Um, I don't want to say pride in it, but at least to, to survive it was the biggest the biggest achievement as so many of the people were involved in it. Two years before it begins, um, a lot of your viewers will be familiar with Downton Abbey and the opening scenes of the first uh, show uh, from the first season, which is the um, staff of the home bringing in the news of the sinking of the Titanic. And for a lot of people, that also is a very huge moment in America, not America, but in world history of the impact of technology and how people had put all their hopes and dreams into having a, a new world with machines dominating and then the gigantic iceberg appears much much larger than the ocean liner and uh, it's all about you know it's the, uh, the I like the satirical newspaper the onion mm -hmm. which uh, their headline on the uh, Titanic is world's greatest metaphor sinks mm -hmm. and then two years later this enormous con unbelievably unimaginable catastrophe, of which so many people before it began waited for it to happen, were anticipating for it, dreamed of it happening. And as it happened, for the first couple of weeks, there was an enormous amount of enthusiasm. As one, some of the saddest, unbelievably tragic films to ever watch are these scenes of all these young men getting on trains all over Europe, flowers in the rifles, women waving at them, and you don't have to be a really good historian to know that most of these men are not going to be alive within the next month, two months, three months, year at a most. So let's uh, step back then and uh, to that uh, pre-Dunton Abbey uh, uh, 
situation and say, okay, uh, where were we, where was Europe in 1910, 1911, mm -hmm. when the scene was being set? Uh, in, in his book, Diplomacy, by uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, he writes about many of the mistakes that you've already alluded mm -hmm. to, that uh, there were opportunities along the way for countries uh, to simply uh, resolve their differences without going to this uh, terrible cataclysmic right. war. Uh, wh where wh was the situation in 1911? And we'll use a graphic to uh, help the, the viewer stay with you on this. <clears throat> There's two impressions that most people have of pre-World War I Europe. One, I'll call it the, um, the sepia one. And that's the, um, there's a wonderful French film called uh, Joyce Noel, which is Merry Christmas. It's about the Christmas truce. And they have some still photographs with their color photo, they've been colorized. And they've taken these images of um, a French countryside and a Paris cafe and uh, a German beer garden and peace and tranquility, um, happiness. Um, the English made a series in the 1960s called The Great War on the anniversary in 1964. Their opening scenes are of Europe at play, it's summertime. Um, that's actually a, probably a false impression. There's an enormous amount of tension in many of the countries that were involved in World War I. Um, the British, we could start from where the war began with the Austrians, if you want, sure. and work our way out, okay. and then we'll finish with the British at the end. We can begin with the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, which is where they're the main protagonists who are going to begin the process that will end up with World War I. They had been defeated by the Prussians in 1866, and badly, in an enormously uh, bloody battle that took place just outside of Prague. Um, Six-week campaign, Prussians used better technology and organization to defeat them. The Prussians and the Austrians spend the next 40 years learning to live with each other as the two Germanic kingdom empires of Central Europe. They had no illusions that the Prussian German Empire was rising and Austria and Hungary were fading. And their tensions within that multilingual, multi-ethnic, some sections very, very poor, others prosperous, there's religious differences, Orthodox, Muslims, and mainly Catholics, all these tensions within the system of so the, Austria. So the Catholics and, and the Orthodox are in the Austro-Hungarian. Right, with some Muslims, too, in the Muslims. areas that they had recently annexed in 1908 mm -hmm. in Bosnia. And Germany at this point is, it includes Prussia. Right. Uh, which we now view as uh, the Baltic states and Poland. Poland right. didn't exist no. during this period. Uh, I often tell my students that pre-1945 that Germans, Austrians, and Russians agreed on very little except that there should never be a Poland. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, I've had some Polish students who their central history, they're, they're taught continually about how an independent Poland is is the reason for their existence. Mm -hmm. So the idea of having the, the uh, map of Europe on the eastern side is in flux. And there's an enormous amount of tensions between, particularly within this Austro-Hungarian Empire, to the south. Um, the Czechs, the Bohemians, the Slovenes, the Slovaks, they all see themselves as members of this empire by default and not by choice. It is, what they, it is what it is. So they have a well-established identity, even separate languages, right. but under the Austrian king. And the Austrians had a difficult time in dealing with all of these groups and having them act, at least on the surface, as loyal subjects of the empire, and at the same time acknowledging that if they didn't allow these groups to have some semblance of cultural identity, that it would be more trouble than it's worth to try to put them down. So there's, within that, you have all these groups who are, just like in today's politics today, extremists tend to move the needle. So mm -hmm. within the, the uh, Austrian-Hungarian Empire, you'd have 
big, maybe sizable majorities of people who were relatively content with their position, but enough small groups who were not. And their life's mission was to make sure that their country or their people became independent. So this is a seething place. And it is a, uh, today you would say it was held together with spit and duct tape. It mm -hmm. is a very, very ramshackle group of people. On the outside though, splendid uniforms. Lots of, they try to buy as much of the most modern technology for military as possible. Their army is organized along linguistic lines. Hmm. Austrian officers leading Hungarians with some Hungarian officers. Um, they would divide the regiments up by, based on where they came from within the empire. Um, always a mystery whether or not that the men would actually do what they were ordered to do or would they end up revolting or not. So it's a very, very um, strange place in a lot of ways, and a, in a, a leftover from an earlier period. And militarily, it's still riding on horseback or f on foot. It's not highly mechanized at all. And no, but they had one of the greatest um, arsenals in Europe in the Skoda Works. The uh. Skoda company, which today makes cars for Volkswagen, uh, they were a um, equivalent to Krupp in Germany. So very, very fine, heavy artillery. They built uh, an army capable of fighting um, both in the lowlands and in the mountains, probably the best mountain troops in Germany mm -hmm. or in, in Europe. So parts of the military um, are quite efficient, but for the most part, it's an army that looks good on parade, but whether or not it would fight well against the Russians was anyone's guess. So let's turn to the Russians. They were, they had a disastrous war against Japan in right. 1905, right. which they surprised to themselves, I guess, they lost. Mm -hmm. uh, they've had the beginnings of a revolution, which didn't quite pan out, but no. uh, it was a sign of things to come. Right. What was going on in, in Russia at that time? The uh, near-death experience of the monarchy um, in, in 1905 was a huge wake-up call to um, I would call them probably forces of modernity in Russia. Um, they had a choice at that point to either move forward, not just in um, outward trappings, but in try to making some fundamental changes, or to regress. And were they going to be part of Europe or were they going to be on their own, separated out from the rest of the... The, the Tsar and his ministers um, and most people say that Tsar Nicholas II was one of the most inept, badly prepared people to ever become a leader of any major country, let alone this one. Um, but they do take some steps in the army in particular to modernize. And so by 1914, 10 years after 1904, 1905, this is a different Russian army than the one that went and was defeated by the Japanese. Um, it's more efficient to a point on a Russian standard. Certainly as big as it was before. Um, logistically, they had come a long way. They were not quite to the point where once fighting began that they could guarantee that their soldiers would have food, weapons, and transport, and medical supplies. But they had more devoted to that than they had 10 years before. More people had moved from the countryside to the cities. So industrialization and urbanization had taken place. The tensions that had pushed the 1905 revolution were still there, though. And uh, the secret police had done um, a pretty efficient job of rounding up a lot of the, the revolutionaries, but they hadn't gotten them all. And there was other people waiting to take their places. That all said, in July, when the crisis begins, of 1914, um, the Tsar and his ministers had a really deep feeling that this war was an answer to prayers, that it would finally unite the, the Russian people against their real true enemies, not the Japanese, but the Germans and the Austrians. And it would be a, a nationalizing force, not a destructive one. There was, again, a, a, a more incorrect calculation, it's hard to imagine. <laughs> but they believed it at that point. So they clearly see, though, that uh, 
Austria-Hungary and Germany are their natural enemies. Right. Uh, they'd had clashes prior to that with the, the right. British uh, all over the map. And the Turks. And the Turks, right. right. But uh, now they're beginning to focus on Europe. Uh, when we, we look at Germany then, uh, Germany uh, under Bismarck uh, had been, it seems to me, the, the great manipulator of politics right. in Europe. Uh, I think one of his successors says he's not as good as Bismarck because he can't keep eight balls in the air at once. <laughs> uh, but they were also saw themselves, did they not, as the battleground of Europe, that there had been so right. many wars fought in Germany right. uh, that they, were, they wanted to now rise up somehow. And, and so think, what did uh, they do? I think that's an interesting point. A lot of Americans, I think, because of our experience with fighting the Germans twice in the 20th century, um, their understanding of German history pretty much is only of the 20th century, and they don't really know what Germany as a country, A, didn't exist until 1871. It was declared a country in France, of all places, in Versailles. Hmm. And then from the period before 1871, it was a collection of people who spoke German who had very different cultures in a lot of respects, huge religious differences between Catholics and Protestants after the Reformation. Pre-Reformation, also very divided. Um, one thing a lot of history teachers love to throw at kids when they talk about Germany and the period before unification is that at one point there were 800 different states of where you would now call Germany. So that made it a very weak place. 800 states. 800. Speaking German, but having little else in common. And that are not part of the Austrians. Mm -hmm. So uh, large, small, obviously, some much huger, bigger than others. But um, one valley over, you're in another country. Uh, so it, took, it was a work in progress for Bismarck to unite these people under one state. He knew he couldn't do it under one faith. The divide between Catholics and Protestants in this very small Jewish population was too great. But to unite them under a state, with Prussia basically as the senior partner and the lead, but to get the Bavarians and the Saxons and Baden-Württemberg and all of these other groups to agree to be part of one German state was going to take blood and iron, and that's why he's called the, the chancellor of that. And the wars he fights in the middle 19th century accomplish that. The huge, huge lesson that the Germans learned in the middle of the 19th century fighting these three short, decisive wars. One quick one against Denmark in 1864, which solidified their northern border. This massive one against the Austrians, which took seven weeks and huge, hugely destructive, but very, very quick. Um, very, uh, casualties probably double the scale of that what you saw in the American Civil War the year before in 1860, which ended in 65, and a lot of Americans have just seen the movie Lincoln, and mm -hmm. most Americans have a sense of just how bloody Civil War fighting was. Imagine the Battle of Gettysburg times three in terms of men and equipment involved, and that's what you get at Sohota and uh, you know, or Königsgrad north of, north of Prague. Um, and that's about when? That's, uh, 1866. Mm -hmm. And that's a... So about the same time as the Civil War, yeah. A year later, mm -hmm. and yep. uh, an army, a, a battle between the Austrians and the, Ger the Germans that probably at one point there were 400,000 men fighting. Enormous, huge battle. Uh, decisive Prussian victory. The, and then the, 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 the big one, the one that they had been setting this all up for, to get Germany united to attack France and get the French to first, to fire the first shot, giving the Germans the excuse to unite all of their other states together to fight against France and make Germany a real state. And they do that in 1870 quickly. Again, six, seven weeks and it's finished. At huge cost, but short. The lesson they learned from all of this is that war works. It so is, they just are drawing the line on France. They're not trying to occupy France, but nope. they're, they're trying to say this is where our border with France is. And they made. knew that the, mm -hmm. in order to get the Catholic states of Bavaria and the Rhineland areas that were not part of Prussia to go along with a Prussian-run Germany, they had to have a mortal threat, and that mortal threat is France. Mm -hmm. and it worked. And um, they learned this lesson, a terrible lesson, that war s fixes things, it solves problems. It, builds countries. We learned it in 1781 when we defeated the English.
So, but learning it in the middle of the 19th century sets the Germans up after 1871 with a very different view of war than places who had been defeated like the French or the Russians or other places. So it's a different attitude towards war, which really will shape how they behave in 1914. Now the Germans, uh, okay, I guess we should continue then. Uh, what's going on in Britain? Britain uh, sees itself as a European power or another, do they have another role in let's, mind? Let's do France first. Okay, go ahead. Let's do France and then we'll move to Britain last. I think the French, because they were this loss that they suffer, mm -hmm. Um, it is complete. It is. So they've lost a war. They haven't lost a lot of territory. Or they lose the equivalent of uh, the United States losing Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina to hmm. Germany. Uh, this, the Alsace, Alsace, Alsace Lorraine, Lorraine. Yep, okay. which a lot of people have heard of. Yeah. Um, the one part of uh, France where people have German last names mm. and they grow a lot of sweet white uh, grapes to make sweet mm. white wine. And the food is terrific. The food in that is area. fantastic. It's a <laughs> wonderful, beautiful place. Mm -hmm. um, I have a friend who, who's a uh, resident uh, from that original here. He lives here in Traverse City, and his uh, f first name is French and his mm. last name is German. Mm. Um, the maps that you would have seen printed in France after 1872 until 1914 have these two black spots where they're the stolen territories. So there's a, um, there's a very, very, very um, strong feeling of revenge and being that, uh, wanting to get back at the Germans after this. The French army in 1870 had fought a very brave and badly managed and organized fight against the Germans. Actually had better technology than the Germans. They had precursors to machine guns and probably the best long range rifle in the world. But the Germans completely school them in tactics, defeat them at every turn, almost, and uh, surround their king, uh, the emperor, Napoleon III, and uh, take him and his whole army basically in one place at Sedan, if you've been to that part of France. Mm -hmm. So this defeat's complete, it's total, it's humiliating, um, Germany is declared in the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. A lot of history has taken place there. Mm -hmm. So the burning desire for revenge in France is the primary thing that we should remember about them. They, it, it didn't blind them, but it focused them. French army reorganizes after 1870. It becomes more efficient. And one of the things that it takes away from this is that its soldiers didn't fight well enough because they were on the defensive. And if they had been on a tactically offensive mind as the Germans had been, they would have won. So the school of the offensive, of, of attack, of bravery, um, takes hold in French military thought. And uh, lasts right up until the end of the summer of 1914. Mm -hmm. uh, the belief among French officers, and they imparted this onto their men, was that you may die in combat, but your comrade will potentially survive and continue the offensive. There will be no retreat. And they, to a point, throw using terrain, defensive tactics, withdrawal, they're, they're all off the table. And when the French army goes to fight the next war, it will, it will fight as an offensive weapon and nothing else. And that becomes the school of thought for 30 years, 30 plus years. It sounds like disaster coming, but we'll it get does. to that. Yes. yes. <laughs> and that leads us to the English. And the British are in um, the most interesting position of all of these countries. They have a uh, enormous stake in peace. They have no territorial ambitions on continental Europe. Their one concern is open sea lanes to get to the various parts of their empire. They're a naval power, they're the world, the yes. sun never sets on the British Empire. Right. And uh, they don't really want to get too deeply involved in what's going on in Europe. No. They can avoid it. Yeah, and they do too. They, um, they watch the negotiations, and uh, this is the point that probably Kissinger would made, of these secret negotiations that take place between all of these countries. Um, after Bismarck is pushed out of power in Germany, his greatest fear was that the French and the Russians, the two countries that had the most to gain 
against Germany would come together in a formal alliance, this happens. And the French and the Russians decide to, you know, Republican France, autocratic Russia, they find a way to make peace with each other. The British watched this carefully. In uh, starting about 1902-1903, they began to start to have conversations with the French general staff. In the event of a general European war, what would the British Army do? How would the Royal Navy act? There's uh, informal conversations that are then pushed to a formal status. And that, in turn, leads to a more clear understanding of, in the event of a German attack on France, the English are going to be involved, or the British Army will be involved, the British military will be involved. Now, all of that said, the, the, the ag argument that you're going to have peace over war is backed up by all these other factors. One of them is that there's no greater investor in German industrialism than the British. Hmm. The international banking relies on peace. It's hard to, I mean, you can, yes, you can make money in warfare, but it's much better to have peace if you're going to be transferring funds from one country to another. That's all centered in London. Uh, the um, amount of travel between these countries by the upper classes and then soon the upper middle classes over being able to move over borders on trains or steamers increases. Um, there are a lot of people in France who would never set foot in Germany and vice versa, but at the same time, at the upper level, there's contact between these groups. Um, and the royal families were all related. All to related, country, yes. Yeah. They're in rivalry with each other, but mm -hmm. they're cousins. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of factors that would have potentially have kept this from being the catastrophe that it ends up being. So that's where we're at with all of these powers. Now, I'll go to another graphic. Maybe there are really two versions of this, uh, which we'll show to our viewers. Uh, and as we, we sort of drift towards uh, the beginning of a war, a great war. Uh, do, do people see this coming? Is this, uh, and uh, who would you say uh, has to bear the most responsibility for it actually occurring? Right. That's a, that's a good question. Um, because one of the things that I think people who want to study history um, as something to gain more than a way of organizing your thinking, or it's a hobby, or you're nostalgic for the past, or is, is there anything practical you can learn from how people have behaved in the past compared to what they do now? Are there signs of things happening now that are similar to what the precursors to this? And I, I, It's a different world that we live in than the one that these people inhabited, but there are some things that do stand out. And one of the things that stood out is that there was an enormous amount of secret diplomacy between these people and their leadership, of which the people at the bottom didn't really know what was happening. The, the French and the Russians, how deeply tied they were together at the diplomatic and military level. Uh, what was Britain's true commitment to Belgian neutrality and helping France? In the People in Britain didn't know this. But the leaders made that. these deals in secret. Right. The terms were never publicized. Right. And and did and the aside from the other country, the single other country involved, did any other country often they didn't know about it either. No. And uh -huh. uh, there's a sense of uh, a game being played at a very 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 high level for enormous stakes, which very few people within these countries have much to say about any of it. Um, and the, um, the main players are the countries that, again, when you look at what, what are we looking at today versus what happened in 1914 is countries who feel they are in decline, who feel that they have to act in order to save what they have, um, can do some really desperate things. And that country, more than any other at this point, is Austria-Hungary. It's the country to look at for why the traditional view that their reaction to the assassination of the Archduke and, uh, by Serbian nationalists is the main reason this became what it became is probably still operational, even so with all the new scholarship that's been done on this. Let me zero in that this precipitating event seems like a small event, but it maybe does. it's huge. 
the Archduke is assassinated by a Serbian nationalist in Sarajevo, yeah, I believe. June 28th. Of 1914. Um, yep. yeah. And if you like counterfactuals, some people know a little bit about this particular assassination. They had two shots at him. Uh, he drove into town. They threw a hand grenade at his car and missed, hit the car behind him. He went to the city hall, berated the mayor and the police chief, and said, I can't believe what a wonderful welcome I'm getting here. And uh, they begged with him not to go back out on the street again. He said, I'm the Archduke. I do what I want. And he did. His driver took a wrong turn. Most of the other conspirators chickened out, didn't fire their weapons. The car stalls in front of the one man who had a pistol in his pocket and was willing to use it, and that's Gabriel Princeps, and he shoots and kills both the Archduke and his wife. Um, weapons provided by the Serbian Secret Service, there's very little dispute that the, the Serbs at some level, did the king know, did his ministers know? We'll never know. But did people in the Serbian government fund this, say yes to it? Absolutely. So it was an extremely dangerous thing to do, and given the context of, you know, the way that people looked at the shooting of the, the heir to the throne of the, of, the Sir, of, the, of the Austrian regime, but it happened. So he's the heir, he's been assassinated, right. and the Serbian idea was they would somehow get independence from that step? It or? was, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's hard, to hard to understand what, yeah. their, their, what, what they thought the reaction in Austria would be. Uh, would the Austrians do more than just protest? Would they do more than call for a blockade, or uh, which is an act of war, or to um, but to invade and to destroy Serbia is in the end what the Austrians decide to do. Okay. And this is this is for them. This is the last. They had had enough of Aus of Serbian independence and Serbian acts, and they were not going to be dissuaded. There was only one country that was going to be able to stop the Austrians from going through, through with this, which is Germany. So then is this one of these secret agreements between Germany it's, and Austria-Hungary? It's a secret agreement, but most people in both countries knew that the Germans had an interest in keeping the Austrians together. It, they didn't see in any, any interest in having more and more chunks of Austria fall apart. So that's not a really big surprise. And it was clear they had had an arrangement already with what's called the Triple Alliance. Once this act happens, the Serbs quickly realize what they have done. They basically put themselves into an existential threat um, situation. They They're, might be destroyed by, they may by a be, combination of Germany and Austria-Hungary. Right. And they quickly make their case to the Russians, who then say, in effect, giving the Serbs a blank check, saying, I, we will defend our Serbian brothers or cousins, a Slavic people. They, the Russians see themselves, uh, or the Tsar sees themselves as a defender of Slavs everywhere. So they're Slavs. They're also uh, Orthodox Christians, right. like the Tsar. Yep. So we were getting, we're setting up here for an ally, uh, right. being a very powerful ally, Russia. The period that's so interesting is this period of the first two weeks of July. Uh, the crisis after the assassination in June 28th, the first two weeks after this do not necessarily lean towards a huge world war. It does seem like there'll be an attack on Serbia, a small one, There'll be some bloodshed, peace treaty, maybe the uh, Woodrow Wilson will fly in or be call in the, the um, ambassadors from both countries. There'll be some kind of arrangement. It'll be over with quite quickly and very few people will die. And if any of them do die, it'll be mostly Serbs and some Austrian soldiers. That's how it appeared for about the first two weeks. And once the mood shifts in all these capitals towards um, now or never. We have to act or our national honors at stake. Things start to break apart quickly in the second two weeks of the crisis, the last two weeks of July. And um, it's at that point, especially in Russia, Germany, and France, probably more than in Austria-Hungary, 
Um, the general staffs of the armies of those three countries basically make it known to their political leaders that um, once mobilization is declared, there's no going back. We'll be at war, and you can't, un you can't unflip that switch. And that's an interesting period when you've worked in the uh, world of both diplomacy and military for a long time, and the balance between these two camps mm -hmm. over who decides what's going to happen when. Um, I think that's a, there's one thing we can pull from that today with the speed of war and technology is how the military staffs basically told their political leadership that once the button is pushed that the politics is over and that the military will now run everything. Everything will be devoted to mobilization. It's, it's particularly interesting uh, that you say that because uh, at, at this stage at least the aims of each of the countries is very difficult to discern. Right. Uh, maybe Russia has come to the rescue of Serbia, Austria Hungary is trying to preserve its empire and, and Germany's helping it do that. Right. But, but what, how do the French and the uh, uh, ultimately the British uh, justify getting in the mix? I think the, the, the French are in the midst of this is a very in interesting new book out uh, called uh, The Lost History of World of 1914. I can't remember the author by the top of my head now, but um, his position is that there are multiple crises happening in all of these places that are totally disconnected from what's happening in this Serbian crisis. Um, one of them is this in France, one of the uh, the whole country is basically enthralled with their equivalent of the O.J. Simpson trial <laughs> happening in Paris. And it is the um, trial of the wit wife of a uh, French politician who had murdered the editor of Le Figaro, which was a very popular, it's still a newspaper, big, newspaper, big yeah. newspaper, over what he had said in the newspaper about her husband. And she's acquitted of his murder just before all of this breaks apart. The British are consumed, not with any of what's happening here, but on a totally unrelated topic, and that's what's going to happen in Ireland if the Protestants in the north cannot accept home rule for the counties in the south, where will the British government go if civil war breaks out in Ireland in the summer of 1914? Huge tension. Uh, people have already been killed. Uh, as tension to escalate, very, very little attention being paid other than by people like you and me who would have been reading newspapers or about other things over what's happening in Serbia. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's an interesting thesis that the world's attention is really, even in July, is not really totally focused on this, this huge potential disaster that's going to await them. It's another thing that kind of the more you know about World War One, the more interesting it becomes. Now, we're headed into a period, uh, this, this buildup has occurred, the countries are, are lining up against each other, and uh, what they think is going to be a short war turns into one of the most bloody yeah. confrontations in a, in a two or three month period right after this. Right. What happens? How did they get into that? The German war plan most people have, if you know anything about this, would say, hold the Russians off as long as they could, maybe put a tenth of the army of the German army on the Russian front, and then slam as much as you could on top of France as quickly as possible in what was called the Schlieffen Plan or some variation on this, which is a, um, a huge push over the top of France coming around the backside of Paris. To do that, you have to walk through a neutral country, which is Belgium. And the Belgians were not fools. They knew that they were potentially in the path of another, of a German attack. But they also, because of their status as neutral, had to act like they would be attacked by the French as well. Uh, they refused to um, coordinate their defenses with the French. And the French at that point basically right off trying to work with the Belgians before war started. So there was very little interaction between the Belgians and the French military staff over what would happen in the event of a war. But what's the crime of the French against the Germans at this stage, or is this just the Germans now trying to, to get some more knowing that the Knowing that the French would 
follow through, if the Russians and the Germans go to war, that the French would follow through on their treaty obligations. The Germans decide their mo mortal enemy will be France first. Mm -hmm. And that's when they move towards France. Uh, this um, initial week or two of the war, from August 3rd, 4th, till about the middle of August, um, before the armies really have big contact with each other, there's still a sense of um, adventure, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, but by the middle of the month, these armies start to have contact with each other. And the first one, actually, to have massive contact are the French armies who are sent to attack Germany in the southern, south, eastern corner of France, down the area uh, around Saarbrücken and that mm -hmm. part of in between the two countries along mm -hmm. the Mosul River Valley that, mm -hmm. that were on that, that part, uh, in what's called Plan 17 by the French. They smash into pre-laid defensive positions. And this French military school of the offensive um, bands playing, uh, uniforms that look like they would have been worn by Napoleon soldiers, blue coats, red trousers, red caps, flags, colors, in the front. Um, it's uh, one of the most amazingly tragic spectacles of disaster, military disaster probably ever. Um, and uh, by the end of the first two to three weeks of Plan 17, probably half of the French armies involved are casualties, either dead or wounded. Wow. Unbelievable. And the, um, it, that is the last really, um, well, you would like to think that that would be the last time that any of these armies decided to go on the offensive against each other, but it's the beginning of what's going to be four years of this. But at this stage, they're still uh, up or above ground. They haven't gone into the right. trenches. But a million people are killed in the first few months? Between August and November, it's a million, a million young men, uh, ages anywhere from probably 18 would have been young for most of these soldiers. They would have been between 19 and 20. Uh, their class, they were called up by class, so the class each year uh, would have been their year of eligibility to be on active duty when this, when this began. Um, and uh, most of those men are killed or wounded of those who went on active duty in 1914 by the end of the year. Wow. The way that the French recruit, well not recruit, but the f way that the French organized their army was they tended to do like, a, and the Germans did this also to a point, um, they tended to keep men from the same region together and often you would have men from one village in one regiment and they'd be all dead in an afternoon. And so you'd have a little village of maybe three to four hundred people in France every young man in that village would have been killed in one day. Hmm. Um, there, you still see these villages in France today. They, they were, they, many of them have become their ghost towns now because of the demographic disaster that mm -hmm. this was. So by the end of 1914, now uh, the people start digging trenches and, yeah. and the battle lines in Belgium primarily. Yeah, it's a race, what's called the race to the sea is from October to November of 1914 as both sides kind of move north and try to outflank each other. Ah, and mm -hmm. um, mainly with the British and the French playing leapfrog to trying to get up and then eventually after the line stabilized around Ypres they leave the British line at um, uh, the northern part of the front with the French picking up a little bit about halfway down the Belgian side. We haven't talked about why the British do what they did though. Yeah, why did they even get involved? Yeah. Their feelings on Belgian neutrality um, are one of the question marks of a lot of people's new scholarship on World War I. Did the British really feel morally obligated to defend a neutral country? Did they feel morally obligated to follow through on their informal and then later formal obligations to the French. Um, as a Vietnam veteran, you probably have had a lot of thoughts about what our obligations were to the people of South Vietnam, especially in the aftermath of American soldiers leaving in 73, most of them. That period from 73 to 75 is an interesting one to study. Mm -hmm. Where do you, um, 
We what might, do you, might get another run at this with Afghanistan right. in 2014. Yeah. That's right. So the British position that they felt that had they stayed out and let events run its course in the continent, that their position after the war would be weaker than if they had been involved. I think it's the only it's the only thing that makes sense to me about why they did what they did. Um, and some historians today still question this, whether this was the, the not only the, maybe that the smart play, but the uh, a fatal one for the fate of the British Empire. And which gets us back to where we are now with um, Downton Abbey and mm. the way of life that ended with World War I. Uh, they just didn't know it yet at that point. Um, so. That gets us to December of 1914, and everybody's involved and everyone's dug in. There is some movement on the uh, Austrian-Serbian front later, and Serbia is almost completely destroyed by this war in 1915. The Russian front has more of a, a, fl a, more of a fluid nature than the Western front does, but I've spent a fair amount of time on the Western front. I spent uh, two months traveling up and down it with my wife uh, three years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's remarkable on how narrow that band is between the Belgian coast down to the border of Switzerland and how you can drive, you never have to drive more than 25, 30 miles and you're within this range of where the front was. And once you're out of that, it's gone. Can you still see signs of the battle uh, on these fields? The, Absolutely. Yeah. And um, in places that you don't expect. Hmm. The, um, the parts that are really quite interesting are the, um, uh, the, the forests. Um, you don't see forests in Michigan where the trees all grow sideways because they're coming out of shell holes. But in areas around Verdun, uh, after the Battle of Verdun was finished and 800,000 men had been killed, the, um, it looked like the moon. And the French, in effect, decided, once peace came, that that part of uh, France would never, it's called the Zone Rouge, it's the red zone. They're, they're never going to have people live there again. They would never f do forestry there again. They would never have farmland there again and they buried as many of the bodies as they could find and replanted trees, and these trees grow all over the place. Mm. And some of the shell holes are huge and much bigger than the studio that we're in right now. My wife and I went and saw one that was the size of a football field. It was a crater, um, uh, probably not from a shell, but from a mine dug underground. The um, physical scars are still there. You can find... Um, one of the things that you will find everywhere are these um, steel poles made by the Germans. They're about six feet tall and they have curly Q shape to them. They're uh, barbed wire holders. And you will see them in fields along the side of the road. Uh, they're not in museums, they're just part of the landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, the French farmers every year in the area in the Somme, um, they go out and they plow their fields in the spring and they stop whenever they overturn a shell or a skull. Then they have to make a phone call to the French Army. French Army spends a fair amount of time in this area picking up unexploded shells, finding the bodies of dead soldiers, um, doing due diligence to try to figure out who they are. Um, one of the things we saw while we were there was a grave of a soldier found in 1999 hmm. who had been there undisturbed mm -hmm. for 80 years. It's a strange place to visit. It's beautiful in many respects, uh, especially the area around the River Somme. But uh, once you get into Belgium it, gets, uh, Belgium, it gets a little less visually interesting, and the weather's not as good either. <laughs> but <Belgium>. um, <laughs> the, the food's good. The, uh, but the, uh, um, the American front is also worth a visit. I think if any of your viewers have never been to France and are wondering what to do in France besides go to Paris. Um, and Normandy. And Normandy yeah. is to take a car ride south of Paris mm -hmm. or a little bit to the, uh, to the east and follow the line of the American army in 1918. Mm -hmm. um, 
they won't have very many visitors and there's a lot of things to see. Uh, one of the largest military cemeteries in the United States military cemetery system is the Meuse Argonne Cemetery which reminds visitors like me of Arlington but without the people. Hmm. And Normandy, if you've been there, you know it's yeah. packed always. There's so many people yeah. there. Um, you can be at Meuse Argonne, there's 70,000 Americans buried there and you could be one of two cars for this whole cemetery. So by 1914, the end of 1914, we've got this major war underway, oh. the First World War. They called it the Great War. They called or? it the Great War right. right up until 1939. And uh, it was the biggest thing ever. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was dragging on and on and on. Where, did other countries join in as it went along? You know, if you... Uh, we put one of these maps up later. Mm -hmm. You'll notice that Italy is on this map and then it goes off. Mm -hmm. uh, the Italians had initially, they'd always, they were part of the Central uh, Alliance probably by default as much as choice. The and Central Alliance being? Germany, Austria, and Italy. Okay. They uh, decide quickly that they have made, they have no dog in this fight. And the only country they really had a territorial problem with was the Austrians. They're theoretically their allies. Mm -hmm. So they drop out quite quickly and by 1916 I believe they begin to actively fight against the Austrians on the, with the side of the of the uh, of the allies. Of the, allies. Mm -hmm. the Turks join because mm -hmm. uh, Winston Churchill in effect forced them to with his plan to take a Balkan route to try to break the stalemate on the west by going through the Dardanelles and Gallipoli. So he, they joined to fight against the British plan. Right. Uh -huh. uh, one of my best friends up here is an Australian. We've often talked about the image of World War I as the central moment of Australian history, that it became a country, not a part of the British Empire because of their experience in World War I, mainly fighting on this eastern side. They did send, Australia sent a lot of soldiers to the Western Front. This was Gallipoli, was it the not? Yeah. yeah, and which is, if you follow military history, shorthand for disaster. Yeah. Um, no uh, prisoners. No prisoners. A, a, war, a Western Front battle fought in uh, not too far away from Troy, mm -hmm. which is ironic. A very ironic mm -hmm. indeed. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the Turks are joining in. The, right. the, the, the Italians have dropped out effectively. Right. The Japanese. The Japanese joined, are in. and uh, they had made peace with the Russians in 1904, mm -hmm. 1905, and. Um, side with the English, the British and uh, the Allies because they were really interested in taking away from the Germans all these Pacific Islands that many American students of World War II will have heard of before. Truck and uh, parts of, uh, the Sa of Saipan, other parts of what was a German overseas empire. Hmm. Uh, the Japanese take them all and uh, become nominally the allies of the British and the French during this. There's a second part of this that is um, we didn't talk about earlier uh, in relationship to the British and that is uh, they had um, one other factor that pushed them towards fighting in World War I besides their belief in Belgian neutrality and that was their fear of the Germans dominating the naval um, uh, dominating them at sea. And the war at sea is another part of World War I that kind of gets lost in the shuffle in the imagery of the Western Front. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a critical part of understanding what happened. And sea lanes and being able to travel at sea safely. Um, the, here's the Lusitania. Lusitania is a big, as, uh, big part mm -hmm. of the story. Uh, almost as many people killed on the Lusitania as died on the Titanic mm -hmm. and in a much shorter period. The uh, mm -hmm. Lusitania sank in 20 minutes. Wow. The, um, the story of the war at sea is something that uh, people today can look at and go, how many of our products and service, our products are being imported on container ships coming across the Pacific from, from China? And what would it mean if our trade was cut off between the Middle East for our oil and China for so many of our products. Um, and the British, by 1914, had let their agriculture system be market-driven. 
which in effect meant that it was cheaper to import food than it was to grow themselves. And when war starts, this becomes a war about food as much as it becomes a war about bullets and front lines and things like that. That's the second part of the war that many people who study World War II know really well. Uh, ration books. The sort of logistics of maintaining a huge effort of this scale, right. global uh, war, effectively. Right. Now, we, we, we're, we're not having much time left, and I know we're going to have to have you back for mm -hmm. another discussion. But could you touch on how the U.S. got involved and, and why the U.S. got involved? Well, you mentioned the Lusitania. And when the Lusit the it's, the, it's a good story, a uh, sad story, obviously, but um, the Lusitania as a uh, symbol of what, what does it take to bring one country in to a war that it didn't really have a whole lot to do with. And that story of a, here you have this gigantic ocean liner that the British had decided um, was safe to continue to run because it was fast. I think it had a top speed of 28 knots, quick. That's fast. And uh, submarines at the time couldn't go that fast. So the feeling was that even though the German submarines had proved that they could sink ships, and they had sunk a couple of German, uh, British battleships and cruisers, all kinds of other um, things, that they couldn't really sink an ocean liner because an ocean liner would outrun it. Um, well, they were wrong. And when the Lusitania goes down, it takes with it uh, about 130 Americans. And that is the point, probably the closest, where we would have been involved in May of 1915 instead of April of 1917. And Wilson decides, uh, against, in, oh, in the face of enormous pr pressure, uh, Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, lots of other Americans were clamoring for war, um, that he will instead give the Germans a note, uh, put them on notice and give them an ultimatum that they can't do this anymore. The Kaiser and the German naval staff, in effect, take that, and they stop sinking neutral ships with submarines for a time. But the reason we were involved is this war of food begins to be the main question mark for the British and the Germans at sea. And when 1917 rolls around and both sides are running out of both men and food, the Germans decide that the only way that they can really win is to starve the British out. And they begin to start sinking every ship, not, many, not only British flagships, but any neutral ship. The theory was that the British had been taking all of their ships and putting up Dutch flags and American flags in any other country other than one of the combatants. Uh, to counteract that, the German submarines are told, sink every ship, unrestricted. If it's out floating, uh, it's not one of ours, it's got to be one of theirs, so take them all out. Um, while doing that, they sink American ships, and when they sink uh, several of them in a couple of week period, the uh, pressure on Wilson is too great and he has to declare war. At that point, though, uh, one of the things that's interesting about the American attitude towards this war and our level of preparation it's really quite remarkable. This war began in August of 1914. The United States military, the Navy's an exception, but the, the Army in particular really doesn't do much to get the, the, its organization ready to do what it needed to do once war was declared. It takes a full year before the U.S. Army is ready to make its move away from America to France and arrived just in the nick of time, basically, in April of 1918. It's a whole year, at least. Well, this is probably a logical stopping point. Mm -hmm. uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've been listening and discussing World War I with Brian McCall, and I'm sure many of you didn't realize what a fantastic expert in World War I history we have in our midst here in, in Traverse City and at the Interlochen Arts Academy. Uh, Brian McCall, thank you so much for being with well, us. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure.